Hi, welcome. If you're new here, my name is Lexi and I have this winning combination of absolutely no self-respect and a willingness to overcommit to every single bit that I've ever done in my life. So I read this book and we're here today to do in the style of my esteemed forefathers, Mike's Mike, Carrie Can Read, There Are Many More. The service of explaining to you the incredibly bizarre and convoluted plot of this book, which on the surface probably seems like your average grumpy sunshine brother's best friend romance novel, but is in reality just entirely unhinged. If you're a romance reader in this decade and you haven't heard of Twisted Love, I regret to inform you that you're living under a rock. And if you're not a romance reader, you're in for a treat, okay? Let me tell you what the girls are up to these days. Now, I know what you're thinking, okay? You're thinking, what a joke. This book is barely 300 pages long. There's no fantasy, there's no magic system, there's no lore to be seen. What could possibly happen in this book that would justify a video with this kind of runtime? <laughs> cute. You have much to learn about the world. Some background. Twisted Love is the first in a four book series that was released by Anna Huang. It was, I think, initially self-published and then picked up by a publisher. The very basic premise of this book is that it follows a young photographer who falls in love with a genius billionaire and it tracks kind of their romance, but also the way that they deal with their respective pasts. And if you think you know where it's going based off of that description, you're wrong. Sorry. After this book was re-released with a cool discreet cover that you can see right here, um, the old cover was kind of criminal. It has just blown up. I mean, as of recording this, this book is still in the top 10 of the New York Times paperback bestsellers list, which is super competitive. Books on that list are selling like a disgusting amount of copies. And in terms of subgenre, it's what I would describe as a dark romance. Nobody really knows for sure what the line is for dark romance versus normal romance. It's kind of just all vibes. And there are definitely other popular books that are crazier, wilder, more fringe than this one. But for reasons you will see, I think that it fits that description. And I just want to say up front that was this book atrocious? Absolutely. But I have never really had such a good time reading something that was this bad. And I'm here to tell you about it so you don't have to read it. Or so if you have already read it, you can relive that wonderful experience with me and my handy dandy wall of royalty free stock photos. So yeah, that's the plan. One more important disclaimer before I start, I just want to say that if you like this book, that's okay. You don't need my permission for the record, but in case you wanted it, you're allowed to like things. In this video, I'm going to be making some jokes and pointing out some significant flaws and red flags that I found in my personal experience reading this story as we go through the plot together. That's what I'm going to do here, but this is fiction, all right? It's not real life. And it's okay to like things in fiction that you wouldn't like in the real world. There's nothing shameful about having a good time reading the story or liking this book. I just don't want anyone to see anything that I'm saying in this video through a lens that makes it seem like I'm looking down on other readers, other women, this author, anything like that, okay? Because that's not true. Genuinely, that could not be further from reality. So instead of leaving comments about how I'm misogynistic because I thought this book was a train wreck and trying to bait me into arguing with you, Let's just nod and say we did. All right, wonderful. Let's get started. Before we're even getting into the juice of the story, the book opens with the following dedication to my mom for all her support and encouragement over the years. Mom, if you're reading this, turn back immediately. There are scenes in here that will scar you for life, which should really tell you everything you need to know about where we're going together today. We also get a content warning about a very possessive slash morally gray lead, as well as a playlist that includes such bangers as Stronger, What Doesn't Kill You by Kelly Clarkson and You Sang to Me by Mark Anthony. Music that surely will have nothing to do with the eventual events of this book and just can't possibly be entirely literal to the story. Anyways, jumping right in. Who's who of Twisted Love? We're going to explore like most of these people as they're introduced, but right now there are only three characters that you really need to know about before we dive into the story. And those are Ava, Alex, and Josh. Ava is the girl main character of this book, and she is a college senior that's majoring in photography. She's characterized as being very kind, vaguely feisty, and super naively optimistic, but in that cute romance girly way that reminds the men in her life that there is good in the world. You know how it is. She also has this whisper of like general repressed torturedness about her, which enables her well to connect with our male lead, Alex. Alex is characterized as being somewhat psychopathic, very tortured, very repressed, and also this incredibly wealthy super genius who of course is also very sexy because I swear to God, if he wasn't, then half of the things that he does in this book would land him in literal prison. I just want to drive that home. An ugly man could not do any of the things that Alex does in this book and get away with it in the hearts and minds of the girls. And to represent the discrepancy between Alex's attractiveness and his generally rancid vibes, I've amassed this collection of red flags. I could have easily picked more, but I tried to kind of group it together into more general qualities as opposed to specific things. And we're going to ceremoniously reveal these as we go through the story and unpack this together. More on that soon. And last of the three important characters to kind of know before we dive in, we have Josh, who is Ava's older brother. He's also Alex's best friend. That's how they're connected. And Josh is really just the classic overprotective older brother. He's generally kind of unreasonable, but he's also loyal. He's smart. He's sassy. He's either in or has just graduated from med school. It's kind of unclear. Nobody really knows for sure much about this man, but he gets his own book down the road. So I imagine we would learn there. Generally speaking, this book is also dual point of view, which means that about half of the 
chapters are from Ava's perspective and the other half of the chapters are from Alex's perspective. If for some reason you're worried about not being able to tell the difference between the two of them when I'm reading quotes from this book, I, I promise you it's, it's fairly obvious. So you're gonna be fine. Okay, that's all you really need for entry level Intel. So let's get started. <laughs> So we're first introduced to our main character, Ava, when she is stranded in a rainstorm following the completion of some kind of like engagement photo shoot for a couple. Because of the weather, she's having trouble finding an Uber to drive her home and all of her friends are just really busy, I guess. So she ends up in her desperation calling her older brother, Josh. And this man being the wonderful overprotective brother that he is, picks up the phone literally instantly, despite being in the middle of smashing a girl in the background of the call. We're on like page six of this book and this unnamed woman is just moaning audibly on the phone, which really is a statement on both Josh's priorities and also on how the reading experience will go, I think, for us as the audience. Anyways, obviously he's busy, so he ends up sending Alex, his best friend, instead to go and pick Ava up. And it's as she's waiting for Alex that we get our first glimmer of lore because we learn that Josh has only been so overproductive of her ever since what Ava refers to as the incident. We don't know at this point what the incident actually was, just that it was in some capacity life-changing for the two of them. Ava also alludes here to a fear that she has of large bodies of water, which could that be connected in some capacity to the incident? I don't know. Who's to say? Let's just say the foreshadowing in this book is not very subtle. <laughs> so Alex shows up, he rolls down the window, he hits her with the kind of angry, get in. And it is immediately established that he is not like other boys, okay? He's cold and mean and not into such beta behavior as making polite conversations with the women in his car. Ava also does us the favor here of giving us two paragraphs of exposition on this man's backgrounds that I feel do a funnier and more accurate job at describing this man's character than any joke I could possibly make. So here you go. He was the exact opposite of Josh. And I still marveled at the fact that they were best friends. Personally, I thought Alex was an asshole. I was sure he had his reasons, some kind of psychological trauma that shaped him into the unfeeling robot he was today. Based on the snippets I'd gleaned from Josh, Alex's childhood had been even worse than ours, though I'd never managed to pull the details out of my brother. All I knew was Alex's parents had died when he was young and left him a pile of money he'd quadrupled in value when he came into his inheritance at age 18. Not that he needed it, because he'd invented a new financial modeling software in high school that made him a multimillionaire before he could vote. With an IQ of 160, <laughs> Alex Volkov was a genius, or close to it. He was the only person in Thayer's history to complete its five-year joint undergrad MBA program in three years. And at age 26, he was the COO of one of the most successful real estate development companies in the country. He was a legend and he knew it. So yeah, kind of like Christian Grey, but in a different font, if you catch my drift. God, I'm sorry, it's just so unserious. Why does she know his IQ? <laughs> Anyways, Alex has been best friends with Josh for about eight years. So since the beginning of undergrad, when they were roommates. They were roommates, one bet. What? And given the fact that per the lore, his parents are dead, he ends up spending basically every Thanksgiving and Christmas during this time with Ava, Josh, and their dad, Michael Chen. And he's kind of like an unofficial fourth member of the family since Ava's mom, who is never named in this book, is dead. But it's like Ava knows nothing about this man other than that basic background. At all of these holidays, those Thanksgivings, those Christmases, he apparently just like never talks to her. They've canonically not had a complete conversation ever before the events of this book over the course of again, eight years. <laughs> and Alex is also nagging her during this drive home every time she tries to talk to him because you know, he's just such a charming guy. And during her attempts to converse with this man who functionally is a brick wall, Ava ends up realizing that she forgot to pick up a cake for Josh. And she's like, Alex, I'm so sorry to be a bother, but can we make a stop at this bakery real quick? And he responds basically by saying, if I take you there, will you shut the up? And she's like, yeah, absolutely I will. Which, you know, <laughs> really great conversation. <laughs> anyway, so they grab this cake and Alex tries not to look at her because that's his best friend's sister and he would never do such a thing. He would never stoop to such a level as that. And they end up going to this party that Josh is having. Now some girls have the audacity to hit on Alex at this party. And through this, we learn that Alex is a man's man. He's rough and tumble, okay? During sex, he is not only anti-kissing, but also anti-eye contact. These are things that are just too soft for our man. And to prove how hardcore he is, he turns down a threesome with two beautiful women. Most guys would have jumped at the opportunity, but I was already bored with the conversation. Nothing turned me off more than desperation, which reeked stronger than their perfume. Now Josh has just graduated from med school. I think, I mean, I mean, it's not really clear, but the party is happening because he's taking some kind of like gap year or time abroad to do some volunteer medicine in Central America, country unknown. They never tell us where he goes. Why would we want to know? So he's kind of doing this like doctors without borders type thing, but God forbid this man leaves his 22 year old growing sister alone for that amount of time. Josh would never, okay, this is not tenable. So he goes up to his incredibly busy, important gajillionaire best friend. And Josh is like, hey buddy, what if you like derailed your entire life for a year and moved into my house, which he lives next door to Ava because of course he does. And what if you just watched her for me until I get back from Central America, country unknown? Could you please forego literally all of your responsibilities and do that for me for no reason at all behind the back of my younger sister without asking her? It'd be so cool of you. It'd be so hip. You'd be such a real one. And because of course he agrees, Alex is like, sure. Yeah, I can uproot my entire life and move, move here and watch Ava and do nothing else with my time. And he agrees to this. Now to be like one centimeter more fair, we do learn here about Liam, who is Ava's crazy 
crazy ex-boyfriend that she broke up with somewhat recently after he cheated on her. We're told that Liam apparently wants Ava back, but he hasn't really done anything at this point that is too out of pocket. Josh just gets kind of bad energy. And I think that he just wants somebody around to beat him up if necessary, since he won't be able to. So fortunately, Alex is up to the job. We also around this time get our very first Alex flashback. Now, Alex has this incredibly obnoxious condition called highly superior autobiographical memory, referred to in the rest of the book as H. Sam. It's kind of like photographic memory, but only for the events in your life. And so when Alex experiences flashbacks in the book, he's like literally playing a videotape in his brain as if it's happening to him in that moment. And he can see everything that's occurring in extreme detail, which is very convenient for the author, as you can probably imagine for the clarity of flashback lore sections, but also probably sucks for him. I mean, he's clearly like a very tortured man. I did look this condition up for this video and unfortunately it is a real thing in the world. <laughs> it's not made up. 62 people in the world apparently have this and, and Alex is one of them. Anyways, so the vast majority of flashbacks that we're gonna get from Alex in the story revolve around a singular traumatic event from his childhood. Slowly we will learn more about this as the book goes on, but right now all that we know is that it involves three very gruesomely murdered dead people just chilling in his living room in front of him when he's like 12. Not a good time, you know, not a good thing to see every time you close your eyes. Alex also gets a call in the scene from new character, his uncle Ivan, where we learn that Alex and Ivan have single-mindedly been working together to avenge Alex's dead parents for the last however many years ever since he was a kid when it initially happens. Now is this related to the flashback? Could this possibly be related to the events? I don't know, Bessie. The foreshadowing in this book is not subtle, but outside of the context actualization. This call in the modern day is really just a check-in. Nothing has happened yet in the revenge plot. It's just something now that we know that they're doing. The expanded Ivan background is that he's the one who adopted Alex after his parents died. And he's also the on paper CEO of Alex's Fortune 500 company that he had his uncle found for him, I guess, when he was a minor because his business sense was just that unbelievable. This man could not be stopped from pulling himself up by his bootstraps. Not even when he was 14, okay? He's too smart. And Alex apparently already is the de facto leader of the company. He can like take control of it whenever he wants, but he has chosen to run it from the shadow position of COO, I guess, because it allows him to Batman his vengeance more effectively. It gives him more flexibility. Who knows? Anyways, sudden flash forward, the first of many sudden flash forwards in this book. The day that Alex is now moving into this house next door to Ava, we meet Jules. Now Jules is Ava's best friend and Josh's sworn enemy. They're the leads of the third book in this series. So take that as you will. And Jules's personality is best described as chaotic, sassy, and brash. This woman is going to school to be a lawyer and she she presents that energy, in my opinion. And she's also Ava's roommate in her house next to Josh turned Alex. Because again, Alex is moving in at this point and just nobody has told Ava about this development. Nobody has thought to update her. And Ava is kind of mad at Josh, as I think anybody would be in this situation. I mean, what's happening is honestly a little bit deranged. And she goes to him and she's like, why would you do this? Like, I'm an adult woman. I don't need a bodyguard. And Josh responds to this completely reasonable complaint by saying something along the lines of, yes, but I'm your brother and I reserve the right to appoint a new brother in my absence. And Alex is now your new brother. So say hello, Yay! congratulations. To which Ava, I guess, is convinced because she's like, so true, you're so wise. Goodbye, brother, enjoy your time in Central America, country unknown. And to prove how just furious she is about the situation and, and about these adult men questioning her ability to handle herself, she bakes Alex a bunch of cookies and hand delivers them to his house a couple of days later. So yeah, she gets over that pretty quickly. Alex's take on looking after Ava is pretty like immediately insane. He installs an entire like super expensive alarm system at her house without telling her or presumably also this other person that she lives with. He has started running these extensive background checks on everybody that she hangs out with or works with. And only one week into this nonsense, he has his first actual breakdown. This man is training at his Krav Maga gym that he goes to all of the time. And he has an idea that Ava would be better protected if she took self-defense classes. And he sends her a text on this topic. Now, Ava doesn't respond to him for one hour. A bitch could be napping and he calls her and she doesn't pick up. So his immediate thought is she must be dead, right? Like this woman, I did not give a single f about one week ago. She's perished. She's gone. Goodbye. I failed. So he storms from his Krav Maga gym to Ava's house and she's not there. And he absolutely grills Jules about it, threatening to literally blacklist her from every law firm in the greater DC area, because apparently this man has a web of mysterious connections that he will use for the rest of this book to accomplish whatever it is that he wants to do at any point in the plot. And this is one example of that, you know, just like toying with this poor woman's future because your best friend's younger sister doesn't respond to your text for an hour. So obviously she caves because that is an insane thing to threaten somebody with. And he drives out with her to this location where Jules says that Ava's with a friend. This man in rage storms into the house and bypasses a poor roommate bystander who's just trying to hold down the fort. Hey, you can't go up there, he yelled. They're in the middle of something. That 
If Ava was having sex, a dangerous rhythm pulsed behind my temple at the thought, that was all the more reason for an interruption. Horny college guys were some of the most dangerous creatures in existence. I wondered if she'd gotten back together with her ex. Josh mentioned the weasel had cheated on her, and she didn't seem like the type who'd crawl back to somebody after they treated her terribly, but I wouldn't put anything past Miss Sunshine and Roses. That bleeding heart of hers would land her in a heap of trouble one day. Yeah, so just a really cool thing, I think, for this man who has only lived next to her for one week to be concerned about Ava enjoying possibly a dollop of casual sex as a treat. God forbid, you know, don't tell mom. But it ends up not even being that because he just walks in on Ava looking at the results of a boudoir photo shoot that she did for one of her friend's portfolios. And obviously she's dressed in just gorgeous lingerie. She's feeling herself, she's laughing, she's having a good time. And Alex, seeing again a 22 year old woman in lingerie, possibly has never been more furious in his entire life. And he responds to the situation in the, the least well-adjusted way possible by yanking the camera out of this poor man's hand and one by one going through and deleting every single picture from the photo shoot. Obviously Ava and her friend do not want to let this happen. So they're like yelling at him. It gets to the point where Ava threatens to go outside in her current fit and, and just let the world see her in lingerie, I guess, which pisses off Alex even more because he ends up responding with the soon to be classic threat of, I will use my mysterious influence to bar your friends from ever doing anything that he could possibly want to do in the world of photography ever again. He will in fact be destitute. Like, is that what you want right now? So obviously Ava just has to give in and, and let him finish deleting all the photos. To her credit, she's upset on the way home as one would be, I think. And Alex just ends up hitting her with the, it was for your own good. So yeah, just very fun behavior from, from the male lead. Once again, one week into this living near each other experiment. And that's really the appearance of Alex's first, I think, tremendous red flag that will, that will carry him through the rest of this book, which is, Boundaries are imaginary, unless they are his. This is a big one, you know, it's a personal favorite. I think most of this book really does come down to this red flag. You're gonna see it come up time and time again. Alex just really needs to be the only person he's around that has any kind of agency at all over what happens to them. More on this soon. So next chapter, Ava is at lunch with Jules and also her two other best friends, new characters, Stella and Bridget. Stella is an Instagram fashion influencer who is honestly kind of inconsequential to at least this book and seems kind of to be the shy down to earth voice of reason kind of type person in the group. And Bridget, meanwhile, is the f***ing princess of a small fictional European nation. It's kind of giving Luxembourg. Sounds like I missed an interesting time, Bridget sighed. All the fun stuff happens while I'm away. Bridget had been attending an event at Eldora's New York consulate, as was required of the princess of Eldora. That's right. <laughs> she was an honest to God, real life princess, second in line to the throne of a small but wealthy European country. What? What is going on? Because that wasn't enough. She also has her bodyguard with her, who is this guy that's retiring kind of soon named Booth. He seems all right, you know, as chill as you can be when you're defending the f***ing princess of a small fictional European nation while she attends like frat parties and raves with her besties in America. Anyways, apparently she's like hella down to earth and cool and approachable, which again, what? Ava's friends are all talking about the altercation that Jules witnessed between Alex and Ava and her photographer friend. Once again, Jules went with Alex to get her. So she saw all of this firsthand. Genuinely, I felt like I was in the twilight zone reading this because all of her friends are like, wow, so funny. He sure did get crazy. You know, what a fun time that must've been. I really wish I was there bestie which is insane. Genuinely, they all deserve like worst friend of the year awards for, for not raising any kind of red flag around this behavior. Not even Jules, who was herself actively threatened, thought it was a big deal. And poor Ava in this situation even says like, I was humiliated actually. She's clearly uncomfortable. And Jules just stays with the mindset of, but it was a really funny time, which is wild. But anyways, the three of them come together and decide for Ava that since Alex has proven himself capable of anger, which is an understatement, they should run f***ing experiments to see what other emotions he might be capable of feeling. Ava somehow gets under Alex's skin, Jules said. We should see how far it goes. How much can she make him feel? Oh my God. You know, just the classic thing to do with someone who has proven themselves capable of acting upon deranged and violent threats. Let's just push them even more. You know, that's the right thing to do here. That's the safe thing. Ava clearly doesn't want to do this, but because her friends are just so cool and good and wonderful, they, they convince her to do it anyways. And altogether, they pick four emotions that she is going to try to make Alex feel over the course of approximately the next week. Sadness, disgust, happiness, and fear. <laughs> and Ava heads home from this lunch thinking about how stupid this plan is, but also still planning to do it anyways, for some reason. I shuddered thinking of how he'd retaliate if he found out what we were up to. And thoughts of being flayed alive consumed me until I fell into a light, fitful sleep. Just, you know, really giving the reader full confidence that this is a great idea. When Ava falls asleep there, she ends up having a nightmare that is apparently recurring that involves her drowning in a large body of water and screaming to her mother, 
to go and help her. Could this possibly be connected to the incidents? Could this possibly be connected to her fear of water? Nobody knows. Anyways, this poor woman wakes up like screaming in the middle of the night, which apparently happens pretty regularly, which is unfortunate for her. And it's like the wee hours of the morning, but Jewel still ends up coming into her room and bringing her tea just to kind of sit with her until she feels better, which is honestly really nice of her, especially considering the fact that this apparently happens all the time. We also learn here about what Ava calls the blackout, which references the fact that she has absolutely no early childhood memories from before the incidents. And then we move on. Meanwhile, the next day, Alex is at work and we get a bit of him playing the cool but ruthless businessman. It's just really important that we don't forget that he's absurdly wealthy. I checked my Patek Philippe watch. Am I pronouncing that right? No one knows. Limited edition, hermetically sealed and waterproof. The stainless steel timepiece had set me back a cool 20 grand. I'd bought it after I sold my financial modeling software for eight figures, one month after my 14th birthday. Oh, you thought earlier that he was like an older teen when he did his teenage gajillionaire thing? Yeah, no, he was barely 14. What? Who does this author think this man is? Anyway, so his work day is firing a couple of people because they're incompetent, hostily taking over a competitor, and then having a flashback where he thinks about a moment less than a year after the event where he swears revenge at 12 on all who have wronged him. I think this is Alex's version of the granola girlies like yoga visualization. This is how he hypes himself up to do hard things. Later, seemingly on the same day, Ava ends up knocking on Alex's door, trying to bait him into watching sad movies with her. She brings a walk to remember and Marley and me to make him cry because apparently any other method is too mean in her opinion. And this is also the first time that she's spoken to him at all since the altercation with her friend, but she has decided at this point that the past is the past. We move on in this house, okay? Don't worry about it. Alex opens the door for her and he is just clearly dressed for a date. And he's also honestly justifiably confused about like why she's there and trying this shit for seemingly no reason. And Ava backpedaling is like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Like we can totally do this another night. Like go out on your date, go enjoy your life, whatever. But obviously he cancels his date on the spot for her and she comes in and they end up watching the movies. And of course he doesn't cry because he's like above the feelings of mere mortals. How are you not crying? I demanded, brushing away my tears with the back of my hand after the end credits rolled. This movie is so sad. It's fiction, Alex grimaced. Stop crying. I can't stop when I feel like it. It's a biological reaction. Biological reactions can be mastered. Biological reactions can be mastered. Okay, shut up. Anyways, Ava here moves closer to him on the couch and starts like stroking his back as a joke, question mark, question mark, pretending to like look for his control panel since he must be a robot if he's not crying to sad movies. And he like snaps her hand away. He looks at her with darkened eyes and he goes, I'm not a toy, Ava. Alex said, his voice lethally soft. Don't play with me unless you want to get hurt. I swallowed my fear. You wouldn't hurt me. This is why Josh was so worried about you. You're trusting to a fault. Don't try to humanize me. I'm not a tortured hero from one of your romantic fantasies. You have no idea what I'm capable of. And just because I promised Josh I'd look after you doesn't mean I can protect you from yourself and your bleeding heart. Which is just a wild thing to say in this setting. And Ava for a second, much like myself, is like, where am I? What is going on? You know, like freeze frame record scratch. How did I end up here? And the two of them end up bantering a bit more. He calls her Sunshine for the first time. That is his nickname for Ava for the rest of the book. And it just obviously alludes to the grumpy sunshine dynamic that, that they have that is just being thrown into our face. And Ava ultimately ends up falling asleep on the couch. Now this man goes and thinks to himself, well, I can't leave her there. She's gonna be uncomfortable, but I'm also a massive ass. So there's no chance that I'm going to be uncomfortable and sleep on the couch. So I guess we have to share my bed and there's only one. Alex then falls asleep to the H Sam memory of meeting Ava for the first time when Ava was like 14, by the way, and thinking about how easy it would be for him to like crush her tiny delicate hands in his grip, which Whoa. And yeah, they have like a subtly awkward morning after, but nothing really comes from it. The next phases of Ava's plan do not go well either in terms of making him feel the targeted emotions. She bakes him these super gross asparagus garlic brittle raisin cookies and forces him to eat one of them in her presence to try to make him seem disgusted. And he pretends to like them for her instead. And she's like, oh my God, crazy. Like he truly is a robot. When obviously this book is just trying to give him like a soft boy moment. Then when she's trying to make him feel happiness, she takes him on a picnic and a dog ends up peeing on his shoes. So that one doesn't work either. And she calls Josh in Central America, country unknown for help on trying to figure out what scares Alex, only to find that in the eight years that Josh has been Alex's best friend, he has never once seen Alex scared of anything, including a bear that was apparently threatening to maul him on a hike, which Alex apparently responded to with like blank discontent, which is classic, truly just exactly what you would expect of this man. So Ava meets again with her friends after all of the trials are done. And she's like, sorry guys, like we failed. This is so unfortunate. And her friends, again, so wonderful, so good and fun are like, you've forgotten about the hidden fifth phase, jealousy. And Ava goes, we didn't agree to that. And her friends are like, too bad because again, they're just so normal. They're just doing things in her best interest at all times. It's their favorite thing in the world. But anyways, when she's at lunch with her friends, she ends up getting pulled away by her creepy ex Liam who just appears out of nowhere to come and harass Ava. And this man's like, please babe, date me again. I swear I miss you. I won't cheat on you again. And Ava's like, no, actually like, 
I'm good, I'll pass. And because Liam as well is just such a stand up dude, he responds by saying, actually, you're a <laughs> If you don't wanna date me after I cheated on you, there must be another man, who is it? Grabs Ava's wrist and she retaliates by kicking him in the groin like a baddie. And she leaves him there just kind of keeled over and, and thinks to herself, you think you know someone until something happens that proves you never really knew them at all. Which just definitely won't be a feeling that she ever feels again in this very book. <laughs> So some amount of time later, no one knows how long, there is this donor gala that's happening at Ava's university. And we enter the scene with Alex as he's preparing to go and manipulate everybody at this gala for information and power, just as rich people do at these events. We can assume as the audience that this is his equivalence to time in the mines when it comes to building his all-powerful network of influence that he uses to do literally anything that he wants for this entire book. But for some reason, even though she's a current student, Ava is there and she's looking fabulous and she's talking with men and dancing with them. Just all things that make Alex absolutely furious. And so he sweeps over immediately to try to intercept Ava before she makes a terrible mistake. However, before he's able to get to Ava, he's intercepted by a girl. Madeline. And that's the girl that Alex flaked on in order to watch movies with Ava a while ago when he was supposed to be out on a date. Madeline is described as being rich and just generally pissed off at the world and very entitled in a kind of like old money way. And remember, she's not like officially Alex's girlfriend. He doesn't do that, okay? And the only reason that they had a date to begin with apparently is because she likes to be wined and dines before they go to town. Something that makes him cringe, by the way. You know, Alex hates that. But she's mad at him for flaking on her and she kind of starts yelling at him a little bit. But most importantly, she's blocking the way from Alex to Ava. So Alex immediately just breaks up with her on the spot so that he can carry on his merry war path towards Ava. Obviously this is kind of random and makes her even more angry. So to calm her down, he just threatens her. And we are not done. Not until I say so. I'm Madeline in house. That's where you're wrong. I'll give you a pass for your tone tonight, given our history, but don't contact me again, or you'll find out the hard way how I earned my reputation for being ruthless. I'm not above ruining women. Anyway, so he just leaves her behind there in shock and he punts away the pleb that had previously been dancing with Ava to take her in for a dance instead. And the two of them have this hilarious conversation that is unbelievably Wattpad, but also is the type of cringe that has just burrowed its way so deeply into my heart that I kind of can't help but enjoy it. Like in a different book where anything else happens, I'd be like, aww. But Alex is trying to get Ava to leave this gala, right? And Ava responds to that by saying, you don't know anything about me. You know, I'm an adult, you can't make me leave. And Alex is like, no, actually, I know everything about you. So Ava goes on to just hit him with a bunch of random questions about her favorite color and her favorite ice cream flavor. And when she hits him with the, what's my favorite season? This man goes, summer, because of the warmth and sunshine and greenery, but secretly winter fascinates you. It speaks to the darkest parts of your soul, the manifestations of your nightmares. It's everything you fear. And for that, you love it because the fear makes you feel alive. <laughs> Oh God, I can't lie, okay? Like, is this completely ridiculous? Absolutely, but it's also a little bit Riz. But then this conversation between them just veers into the territory of like, where am I? How did we end up here, given the fact that you've had an amount of positive conversations with this man that I can count on one hand? Because Ava responds to this by saying like, wow, like how do you know me so well? How did you know all of those things about me? That's so specific. And Alex is insufferable, so he's like, I observe, I know things, it's what I do. Ask me something real, sunshine. And this woman is like, what do I want? And he goes, love deep abiding unconditional love you want it so much you're willing to live for it you want it so much you'd say yes to anything believe in anyone one more favor one more kind gesture and maybe just maybe they'll give you the love you want so desperately you'd <laughs> yourself out for it and obviously eva has to read him right back here and give him her romance monologue moment because why wouldn't she are you talking about me or are you talking about yourself you must have me confused with someone else sunshine i don't think i do you don't fool me anymore alex volkov i've been thinking about it the way you noticed all those things about me how you agreed to look after me even though you could have said no how you stayed in to watch movies with me when you thought i was upset and let me stay the night in your bed after i fell asleep and i've come to a conclusion you want the world to think you have no heart when in reality, you have a multi-layered one, a heart of gold encased in a heart of ice. And the one thing all hearts of gold have in common, they crave love. <laughs> and again, I just feel the need to drive home that up to this point, they've had two, possibly three non-hostile conversations in which Ava has learned essentially nothing about this man. Every single other interaction that these two people have had has been either vaguely antagonistic, somewhat stalkerish, or like completely disinterested. I don't believe for a second that Ava has any reason to believe that this man has a heart of gold, but we take what we're given. Anyways, Ava still refuses to leave the gala after this point, but with the seeming compromise that for the rest of the night, Alex won't see her doing anything too risque with another man, like talking to them or interacting with them in any way, or God forbid dancing 
messing with them. But eventually she disappears and Alex is on his way out anyway, so he just plans to like check in with her when he gets home. When right outside of the doors of the Scala, he overhears Ava telling somebody to get off her. And it turns out that Liam has once again crashed the scene. Liam is holding her against the wall with her wrists above her head and kind of just like blubbering misogynistic nonsense at her. And Ava warns him. She's like, let me go immediately or I'm going to hurt you. And Liam being stupid and also evil does not take her seriously. So she ends up headbutting him straight in the face and breaking his nose. He kind of like backpedals it a little bit and he's really pissed off obviously, but before he can do anything, in sweeps Alex with a punch just directly to his gut, then a punch to the face, then a punch to the broken nose. And Alex goes on to just continue hitting this guy over and over again, long after he's literally unconscious and is functionally a bloody mass on the ground. Alex, stop, you'll kill him. I adjusted my shirt sleeves, breathing hard. Is that supposed to deter me? Anyways, Ava's able to convince him not to kill Liam. And as the two of them are leaving, Ava's like, we should call 911 for this guy. I mean, he's clearly in dire straits. And Alex responds to this by saying, nah, we don't have to, you know, I gigabrained every single one of my punches to only hit non-vital organs. So don't worry, the guy's gonna live for sure. Like I'm an expert at this kind of thing, which is a lot to unpack. But Ava's like, no, like we, sh we should still call an ambulance actually. So the two of them do, and then they just drive home. Now this is a great example of another red flag that Alex has throughout this book, which is his tendency towards displays of gratuitous violence. I feel like this one almost speaks for itself given what you just witnessed. More on that soon. So the two of them are driving home, I guess, from Alex almost beating that man to death. And in this moment, Ava has a random waking nightmare, which is something that she's never had before. Normally it's only when she's asleep. And we learn together during this flashback as the audience that at the time of the incident, Ava's parents had recently gotten a divorce and Ava's dad had taken Josh while Ava stayed with her mom, who was just not doing very well psychologically. And young Ava is just thinking about all of this and trying to kind of understand her new reality as she sits on the pier and skips some stones when suddenly she smells her mother's perfume and her mother just goes behind her and pushes her into the lake. A new bit of lore. It was her mom who pushed her. Anyways, after this terrible flashback, I guess, just with everything going on at this point, it's here that Ava decides that she likes Alex. I realized that I wanted Alex Volkov to care very much. I wanted him to care because of me, not because of a promise he'd made to my brother. Talk about a terrible time to come to such a realization. I was a freaking mess and he just beat the living daylights out of my ex-boyfriend. Like at least she's self-aware about how crazy this entire thing is. And Alex sees her crying after the flashback and is like, dude, if Liam made you cry like this, it's over for him. I will destroy him. Alex's words sliced through the air like like lethal blades of ice. Goosebumps blossomed on my skin and I shivered, my teeth chattering from the cold. Everything he has ever touched, everyone he has ever loved, I will ruin them until they're nothing more than a pile of ashes at your feet. <laughs> Just riz for her, I guess. That's not why she's crying. It's because of her flashback, but she's not really ready to talk about it with Alex. So they end up going to a diner together and obviously he convinces her to talk about it anyways. So Ava tells him everything and underlines the fact that she has a really complicated relationship with love and feeling like she's deserving of it, especially given the fact that again, her mom tried to kill her. Her dad apparently like never pays attention to her. And she says that Liam cheating on her kind of just felt like another example of somebody who was supposed to love her not actually doing so. Possibly to her because she is in some way just fundamentally unlovable. Alex hits her here with a line that I think is actually pretty good, especially if it were coming from literally any other male lead. But again, credit where credit is due. Liam is an idiot and an asshole, Alex said flatly. If you let lesser people determine your self-worth, you'll never reach higher than their limited imagination. He leans forward, his expression intense. You don't have to work overtime to get people to love you, Ava. Love isn't earned, it's given, which is really nice. But then it's instantly ruined by Ava being like, but you don't believe in love. And Alex says, personally, no, but love is like money. Its worth is determined by those who believe in it. And you obviously do. And I hate that. Anyways, Alex ends this journey by revisiting the fact that he wants Ava to be taking Krav Maga lessons. And Ava's like, sure, I'll do that for you, but only if you sit for portraits for me, for my portfolio, kind of like a quid pro quo, if you will. And instantly next chapter, he does. He comes into the photo shoot, just looking like a snack. And they shoot a bunch of photos. The entire shoot is just riddled with sexual tension and banter but nothing really happens. And then random time skip again. And Alex is at work talking with his uncle when randomly he gets a social media notification. And for reasons that are completely unclear to me, just like decides to look because somebody so happens to randomly be live streaming in arguments that Ava's just randomly having at this party with Madeline, who again is Alex's old money, rich, entitled ex-girlfriends, but kind of not really. And it turns out that Madeline saw the two of them dancing and talking at that gala after Alex nagged her. And she is just absolutely furious. Just a big girl rage moment. You know, you just love to see a catty woman who exists only to be a catty woman and nothing else in a, in a romance novel. It's just so cool and fun as a trope. Anyways, Madeline says to Ava, Alex will never go for you, okay? You can't handle him. You can't handle the truth. And Ava's like, what? What do you mean? And Madeline says, he likes it rough. He's anti-kissing and anti-eye contact. Take that, checkmate. And Ava on the inside is just like, oh, what if I 
like that, just down bad. But on the outside, she makes kind of the girl boss decision to just lie out her ass to make this girl mad. And she tells Madeline that Alex is just different with her, you know, like he looks at her, he kisses her. He probably just never really liked Madeline to begin with. That's probably what that was. Which again, kind of a slay. And blah, 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 they argue, this obviously makes Madeline more mad. And for some reason they're doing this entire shtick, like one foot away from this massive indoor pool. Despite the fact that Ava, again, is apparently terrified of large bodies of water. I don't really know why she's that close to the pool to begin with, but whatever, it gets to the point where Madeline is so mad that she ends up pushing Ava into this pool that just happens to be right next to them, not knowing that Ava can't swim. So Alex sees all of this, again, on this just random Instagram live that he happened to be scrolling while at work on important calls. And he drives over in this furious rage, as you'd probably expect by this point, and he gives his classic, I will ruin you or else threat to Madeline to try to barter with her for information on where Ava has gone ever since he saw the live. And even though she gives him said information in his internal monologue, he's still like, F what I told Madeline earlier. She put a huge target on her family's back and I wouldn't rest until House Industries was no more than a footnote in corporate history. So rest in peace her and her entire family, I guess, you know, like enjoy poverty. But Alex finds Ava and they talk a little bit about how frustrated Ava's fear of water makes her, especially in situations like that, but also because she wants to travel eventually, but she can't stomach the thought of flying in a plane above that big of an ocean. And she ends up asking Alex to help her work through this phobia and ultimately to teach her how to swim. And that's exactly what the two of them do, starting with like meditations and visualizations, working herself up to being able to actually get into a pool. And let me tell you, his patience, when he's helping her out with this, just rizzes her the rest of the way back up. And this woman is now obsessed with him. All previous sins are forgotten, okay? They don't exist. This is the perfect man. And random time skip again, Ava ends up planning him this surprise birthday party that has the sole ulterior motive of seducing him. And she's successful because the two of them end up finally having a sloppy makeout in the kitchen before he pulls away and starts like acting all weird. And he hits her with the, I'm trying to save you, Ava. He said out of nowhere, right as we finished all the dishes and I prepared to flee. From what? I refused to look at him, but I could see him watching me out of the corner of my eye from me. Really respectful, again, of Ava's agency and her ability to make her own choices. You know how it is. And Alex is like supremely at odds with himself, by the way, in his entire internal monologue up to this point in the book, because on one hand, he's already decided that Ava's his, apparently, like she's never to look at another man ever again. But at the same time, he's just like too spooked, I guess, to go all the way. The only other thing, by the way, that we learn about during this party is that Alex is bad at singing when he refuses to do karaoke. That can't possibly matter or come up later. You know, there's no way. Anyways, five days pass after this and Ava apparently has still not texted Alex in this time. So Alex responds to this silence by just pulling up to her place of work, which is a photo gallery with like a brand new top secret iPhone 18. And he hits her with the, your current phone is clearly broken since I haven't received so much as a text from you in the past five days. And obviously she's like, no, I don't know what you want me to say. I kissed you, you kissed me back. Then you said it was a mistake and we agreed never to do it again. I thought you wanted space and I gave it to you. I'm not one of those girls who chases after guys who don't want them. And she explains herself and she says that she can even find a new swim instructor if Alex doesn't want to do that anymore. And Alex is just like, nah, -uh. the hell you will, I snapped. You asked me to teach you how to swim. I'm the one who worked with you all these weeks. If you think I'm going to let some <laughs> swoop in and take what's mine, you don't know me at all. We're resuming lessons this weekend. Don't even think about trying to find someone else. And I guess just to prove that he's serious about this or maybe to I mean, nobody knows for sure. He also decides in this moment to buy the most expensive photo in the gallery, just dropping $40,000 and giving her commission on the purchase, which is a weird thing to do, but you know, get your bag queen. Random time skip again immediately after this. And the two of them are meeting at this hotel pool about a week afterwards. And all is well again between the two of them. And it's a big day because this time Ava's actually going to be getting into the pool and trying to swim around for the first time after all of the prep that the two of them did. And she does, she gets in, she's swimming, she's doing pretty well, right up until she crosses into the deep end and she has to put her head underwater, which instantly results in a trauma response. And she ends up having a panic attack. And then immediately after the panic attack, she looks at Alex and she's like, kiss me, you coward. And Alex is like, whoa there, you just had a panic attack. And Ava's like, I'm fine, okay, kiss me, you coward, again. <laughs> and Alex darkens and he's like, you don't even know what you're getting yourself into. And Ava's like, but I do know. Madeline told me and I like it, which makes this man as horny possibly as he has ever been in his entire life up to this point. And so he runs into the hotel and rents out the penthouse suite and they go up and they finally smash. Page 156, if you're curious. Anyways, before they actually do the deed, Alex is like, you know what this means? And Dave was like, no. And inside of his internal monologue, Alex is like, ah ha ha, so innocent, so naive. And he gives her this monologue. It means you're mine. Your mouth is mine. Your are mine. Your is mine. And your is mine. Every inch of you belongs to me. And if you ever 
ever let another man touch you, he'll end up in pieces. And you'll end up tied to my bed and <laughs> in every hole until my name is the only one you remember. Do you understand? And Ava, I think very turned on in this moment and probably assuming that this is an exaggeration, which is a fair assumption to make. Everyone there is horny, you know? Sometimes you just say shit. She's like, yes, I understand. I belong to you. Not having the faintest idea of what is to come in her future. And this is where Alex's last major red flag appears for the first time in this book, which is dating him means he owns you. And you're gonna see this evolve over time in some really fun and interesting ways. Also notable here is that not only does Alex kiss Ava, he also makes eye contact with her. These are big moves, okay? This is different for our man. He's growing. And that's really all there is to it. I mean, this scene really just serves as the entry point to the mid-book smut montage, which is where the vast majority of the explicit scenes for this entire book just happen one after another for about four chapters. The two of them go on to smash like innumerable times in that hotel room, both on page and implied. And Ava, bless her heart, tries to have like a DTR to figure out what's going on between them during the smut montage. And Alex is like, well, I mean, you did agree to this, you know, like I've already told you what the rules are. You can never sleep with another man in your life or I'll kill him. So it seems pretty exclusive to me. And Ava's like, oh, so true. Also so hot and normal as behavior. The two notable things to happen during the smut montage event wise and also general lunacy wise, Alex takes a business call and starts like brokering a deal while also actively smashing Ava in the background. Really a full circle moment back to the beginning of this book with Josh. And it's also just like one of those billionaire things that I feel like every book like this feels compelled to do to prove that the man is ambitious and a capitalist icon. And then the other thing is that later the two of them end up smashing in the student health center during this like fall festival thing that's happening in Ava's university, which is crazy. Like in the health center, excuse me. Anyways, now you're disarmed. Just completely sold on how wonderful the relationship is going to be between the two of them forever now. And it's at this point that the book decides to just have a ton of completely ridiculous events happen one after the other. More happens in the next like approximately 60 pages of this book than in most Netflix original series. Why do you think I made this board? Okay, like it was for this. And when I was reading this, I didn't really expect this book to have a plot that was relevant in any capacity to the story. So let's just say that what we're about to experience together was a surprise. <laughs> random time skip again. And suddenly Ava is having this just really bizarre interaction with her dad, Michael. It's their first on-page contact. In the book, I think we've seen him described previous to this, but we have not met him until this point. And Ava has brought him a cake for his birthday and she's like trying to eat it with him and talk with him, but it is just awkward beyond hell. They cannot hold a conversation to save their life. And we learn through this that when Josh is not in Central America, country unknown, he's typically the person who has brokered their relationship and, and made family gatherings actually livable because this is kind of grim. Like it's just clearly uncomfortable for for both of them. Ava's also Chinese, so she theorizes that her dad might just love Josh more than her because of a deep-seated cultural preference for sons over daughters, and just a general cultural alienation of parents from their children in terms of friendly and vulnerable relationships, which is pretty interesting as a theme, just randomly sauced in there, but we're never gonna revisit this again. It's just a thought. So we just move on. All that you really need to know is that this conversation between the two of them was really weird because within 10 pages, Ava's back with her dad again, this time on Thanksgiving. Alex is there and the two of them are like, ha ha ha, we can't tell my dad that we're together because he might tell Josh. And Josh would murder us both. If you've forgotten, he's a very protective older brother. He would not stand for this absolute nonsense. So the two of them for all of two pages are just comedically trying to hide the relationship, but they kind of fail. And then it kind of doesn't even really matter because all of a sudden Ava's having another nightmare, but it's about something that isn't the lake. That's weird. Possibly a second incident. Nobody knows for sure. It's very blurry. It's very unclear. And Ava wakes up kind of rattled from this experience and she ends up going outside to think. And her dad just happens to live right next to a lake, not the original lake, but a lake nevertheless. They just love lakes in this family. And when she on this walk, her dad comes outside to go like exercise or do whatever old men do early in the morning. And she has another memory that's bubbling up and get this, Ava realizes in this moment that it was not her mom who pushed her into the lake when she was a kid. It was her dad. Michael Chen. And obviously she starts panicking here and her dad kind of like runs over to try to comfort her, not knowing obviously what is going on. But fortunately, Alex has woken up and he zooms out there to comfort her. And then once they leave together is immediately hitting her with the like, who we gotta kill? Who we gotta fuck up? What lakes do I gotta drain, babe? I'll drain every lake in this world for you. Except he's being like dead serious because he's a crazy person. And so Ava just goes on to lore dump to him and also to us about everything that happens. Which is that her parents were in the middle of the divorce during the start of the incident. And Ava at the time was living with her mom when the two of them were like, let's go play outside by the lake. So they walk out there and Ava's mom realizes that she forgot sunscreen inside or something. So she's just like, stay here, honey, and watch the water while I run and get it. And Ava's like, okay, cool, I'm six. And her mom runs inside and then out of absolutely nowhere comes Michael Chen who just runs up and shoves her into the lake. And Ava now knows for sure that it was him because the memory that she uncovered was seeing his signet ring that has his initials on the hand when she was pushed. So yeah, not a good time for her. And literally the next page, Ava's throwing up into a toilet, thinking about how awful it is that this is just her life now. When she suddenly remembers the second traumatic event, which is in fact, 
the incident part two. And we get another flashback section where we learn immediately all of the context behind what happened. And what happened is that when Ava was in third grade, she wrote an essay in class under the prompt, who is your hero and why, about how her dad was her hero because he saved her from drowning when she was young. Which is true, by the way. Michael is both the person who pushed her into the water and also the person who saved her life. She writes an essay about how he saved her life and she gets this really good grade on it and she brings it back to show her dad. And her dad just looks at this child and like seeds about how much she apparently looks like his ex-wife, Ava's mom, who again, by the way, is just never named in this book. And Michael decides just on the spot that he's going to kill her and suffocate her, like right there and then in his office with a pillow. Again, you know, just not the greatest plan. I'm not really sure like where his head was at on this or where exactly he expected this to go if it worked. You could say the I's were not dotted, the T's were not crossed. But yeah, that's what happens between them. He's like, do you remember the lake? And she's like, no, I don't, but thanks for saving me. And he's like, well, good. Maybe you won't remember this either. Ah ha ha ha, and just starts smothering her into the couch. And she ends up not dying because young Josh chooses this exact moment in time to run upstairs and interrupt the entire thing, which Ava's dad somehow covers this up and like everything's fine. But because Ava is so like instantly traumatized from this experience, in this moment, she forgets literally all of her memories. They're all gone. That's the actual cause of the blackout, which we have learned about earlier and the reason why Ava has no memories of her childhood. And yeah, Ava becomes just like a fresh faced baby in the world all the way up until the present day on page 197 of Twisted Love when she is suddenly remembering all of these things again. So yeah, that's wild, obviously. And Alex and Ava, knowing all of these things now, have within one page of the actual book, again, by the way, sends for Ava's dad to meet them at Alex's company, claiming that there is just some kind of emergency that they need his help to handle. So obviously Michael goes and he's like, why the f am I here? Like, are you pregnant? Please don't be pregnant. That would be unfortunate. And Ava's like, please, babe, let me speak to him alone. Okay, like I wanna handle this myself. So Alex leaves the room and it's just Ava and her dad. And Ava confronts him. She's like, so you tried to kill me. And her dad's like, what? No, I would never do that. Like, I'm your dad, you know? Like, that doesn't sound like me. And Ava's like, but you tried to kill me twice. And her dad's like, what? No. And she goes, but the essay from Mrs. James's class, you cannot trick me. And Michael, for some reason, thinks that this is a good time to try the experimental strategy of Ava, he said softly calmly, like he didn't want to spook me. You never had a teacher named Mrs. James. Which, you know, is a choice, considering that it's about the easiest thing about this situation to factually confirm. And of course, Alex, because for better or for worse, he's a f***ing freak, has done exactly that. And Ava's kind of just reeling here from the fact that she has to cope now with the idea that her dad has just been actively gaslighting her forever. So Alex chooses this moment to just stride back into the room. And he's like, actually, I investigated and I learned it all. There were bruises all over her that you said were from a playground accident. There was no playground accident, was there, Mr. Chen? And yeah, Michael cracks it this point, he literally says, bravo, I almost had you, and slow claps. And then he delivers what can only be described as a villain monologue over approximately the next four pages that just describes his entire plan in detail that has now been foiled. And most of this is just repetition and kind of another angle of all of the things that we already know at this point. But it turns out that all of this happens because Ava is not actually Michael's biological daughter. It turns out that her unnamed dead mother cheated on Michael. Probably. I mean, she denies it and, and you don't even really know for sure. Like there are other things that it theoretically could have been, but Michael certainly thinks it's true. And it's not like Ava's mom is alive to say anything on the matter. So that's what we're going with. Ava's an illegitimate daughter. But unlike Ava, Josh is his real son, which is why Michael has always been able to talk to Josh like a normal person, you know, like that's his heir. That's his legacy. Just a very like feudal vibe in this family. But apparently during the trial, he couldn't tell the judge that his wife cheated on him in order to get custody of Josh because it would just doom his reputation in his local diaspora community. So instead, he decides that the way that he's going to win custody is just by planting a f ton of drugs inside of Ava's mom's house. And apparently the day of the incident is when he's going to do that. You have to imagine having done like absolutely zero research on when they're gonna be out of the house so he can actually like sneak in and not be caught. I don't really know what this man's plan was if he just like enters this house to plant the drugs and his ex-wife is like, what are you doing here? You know, it was just a bad call. But he doesn't run into his wife because before he goes in, he sees this wonderful crime of opportunity with Ava just chilling on the dock by herself. This man apparently thinks to himself, you know what, even drug addicts are able to get custody sometimes of the children, but you know who won't get custody for sure? A drug addict who also attempted to murder one of the kids. That'll do it, that's what I'll do. And so he pushes Ava into this lake, but in his villain monologue, he's like, ah ha ha ha, not even I am so evil to let a child die, even though he hates her and will try to kill her again later. And he fishes her out of the lake and just like immediately warps her memory. He smirked. It's quite easy to implant false memories, especially in the minds of a confused, traumatized child. A few suggestions and leading questions from me, and you were convinced it was your mom. Said you smelled her perfume, plus she was the only person there. So this is so successful that Ava is the one who ends up telling the cops that her mom pushed sure in and lo and behold, Michael wins full custody. And yeah, Ava's mom goes on to use the drugs apparently that Michael did plant at some point. Nobody knows exactly when he planted these and she ends up overdosing on them not too long after this custody hearing. Oh, and also regarding the office suffocation incidents number two, Michael, I shit you not, is like, yeah, 
that was a bit of an oopsie, you know? I was just really mad since you look so much like your terrible mom. And so as a result, I thought I would kill you. You know how it is sometimes. But then imagine that, Josh came home and I had to let you live after all. It was pretty cool though, that you didn't remember anything. So that was just a really great coincidence, you know? And so I thought it was fine, but decided that it would be too risky for me to attempt again. So here we both are and you're alive. Yay! Anyways, yeah, so that's a lot. That was his villain monologue. Ava's having internally an existential crisis as one would in this situation, honestly. But in this moment of like triumph for Michael, I don't know exactly what this is. I don't know exactly what he's feeling right now. I don't know why he felt the need to spill his entire dark life story in this moment, but Alex hits him with the DC has a one party consent law for recordings and Ava consented before we started this conversation. You're going to jail, sucker. <laughs> and then Alex brings in the FBI who have just been waiting outside, you know, hanging out this entire time as they do, genuinely to be as delusional as Michael Chen because this man goes, I'll fight this. You know, that recording that you have of me confessing to literally everything I did alongside all of the receipts that you have painstakingly compiled, like those won't hold up in court. I'll get the best lawyer in the galaxy. Okay, you're not gonna stand a chance. And Alex responds by saying, with what money? I reported your tax evasion and corporate fraud to the FBI as well. And now you have no assets. So good luck getting that lawyer. <laughs> and Michael's like, home? Hello? And he recovers and goes for like a death rattle here. Josh will never forgive you for this. Michael's eyes burned. He worships me. Who do you think he'll believe? Me, his father, or you? a punk he met a few years ago. But who do you think is outside of that room in this very moment? You guessed it, it's Josh. Back from Central America, country unknown, just in time to punch his dad in the face and go, I think I'll believe the punk. And Josh goes on to just beat the out of his dad in front of, again, the FBI, who are just like vibing right there until Alex is the one that pulls Josh off of him. And then yeah, Michael's off to jail, quote, bruised and bleeding. But fortunately, Alex has a friend really high up in the FBI because of course he does. So Josh doesn't get arrested for this. It's like completely fine, which is just insane. Basically everything in this part so far has happened within about 15 pages. Let's just say that. So yeah, good Michael, but what's next? Because obviously there has to be more and more there is, okay? We're not done, bestie. We've barely begun to explore what the f is going on in this book. But before we get into any of that, this book is like, oh yes, I remember remember now, I'm a romance novel and is temporarily just completely normal for one chapter. Ava talks with Josh about his commitment problems, which surely is just like setting him up for his book. We spent the next half hour talking about lighter topics, his time in Central America, what DC luxuries he'd indulge in before he returned to his volunteer program, and his now dead relationship with the girl he'd told me about. Apparently he'd ended things immediately after she brought up marriage. Typical Josh. Typical Josh, just chatting the day away, mere moments after beating the shit out of your dad. What are you doing? Like, how are you having this conversation right now? Josh also obviously knows at this point about Ava and Alex, and he rants to Ava for a second about how even he, as Alex's best friend, knows that Alex is kind of slimy. And Ava's like, no, he's so protective and wonderful. He taught me how to swim. He brought me into the pool. He saved me from my evil dad, and he's the perfect man, and I love him. Yeah, it's during this conversation with Josh that Ava realizes that she loves Alex, and it's chill after that with Josh, you know, like he accepts it, good for him. And later, Alex brings her cupcakes when she's just hanging out with her friends and kind of thinking over the entire situation. And in her internal monologue, she hits the reader with the, that old saying was true. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I'd almost died twice in my life that I knew of. And I was still standing. I'd continue to stand tall long after Michael rotted in jail. Our couple ends up having their I love you scene. And it's actually pretty cute, even though Alex doesn't like directly say it back. I'm not an easy person to love. Good thing I never cared much about taking the easy road. You're cold and infuriating and and I admit, a little scary. But you're also patient and supportive and brilliant. You inspire me to chase my dreams and drive away my nightmares. You are everything I didn't know I needed and you make me feel safer than anyone else on this planet. What I'm trying to say, again, is I love you, Alex Volkov. Every part of you, even the parts I want to slap. A smile goes to his mouth. That was quite the speech. The smile faded as quickly as it had come and he dropped his forehead to mine, his breath ragged. You were the light to my dark sunshine, he said in a raw voice. His lips brushed against mine as he spoke. Without you, I'm lost. But it's just wild to me that this is happening right now. I mean, like the emotional whiplash that you feel watching this video, I felt when I was reading this tenfold. And just like that, after that small break, blink and you miss it, we're back to the plot, okay? Alex heads over to visit his uncle and he's checking in with his uncle because we learned that for the time being, his revenge has been completed, even though there are still like a few irons in the fire that he needs to kind of figure out. Most of it is done. And to celebrate, we finally get a full picture of the event, which is told in first person as if he's actually 12. I was annoyed I'd never beaten Nina at Scrabble for kids, even though she was two years younger than me and I had a quote unquote genius idea. 
IQ, according to my teachers and parents. Just because we can't forget for even a single second how smart Alex is. And in that vein, during this entire saga, apparently Alex was supposed to be at a camp for like super nerdy, super genius children, but apparently it was just too easy for him. You know, like his brain is just so big. He went home early from the camp and he ends up witnessing like this entire thing. Alex's family is just hanging out at home when suddenly some guys just start to try to break into the house. And his parents are on that shit, okay? They're like, Alex, Nina, go and hide in the secret passageway that we carved behind our fireplace. You have to protect yourselves, like this is dangerous. And that's what they do. But Alex's cat ends up jumping out of Nina's hands and just running out towards the closing fireplace door. And because Nina's a literal child, she runs after it and back into the living room. So yeah, it's just Alex now in this passage, looking out into the living room using a peephole that's carved into the secret door and just watching as these two guys apparently just go on to slaughter his entire family in front of him. They don't kill the cat, which is nice. If nowhere else, this book draws the line in animal abuse, I guess. But the guys who kill Alex's family know for some reason that he's supposed to be at a sleepaway camp. So they don't look for him, they just leave. And yeah, Alex, I mean, obviously that's a scarring experience for him to go through. And it ends up kind of being his Batman moment. And he swears vengeance, justice, revenge, whatever, all of those nouns on the guys who ordered the hit. So yeah, back to the modern day, Alex and Ivan are having this really weird conversation about him completing his revenge that just can't possibly be related in any way to the events of the story thus far. Surely not. But Alex also learns during this conversation that Ivan has been kind of like stalking Alex's work habits, which really rubs him the wrong way with how much attention Ivan is giving him. So after Ivan leaves, Alex just decides to search his entire house. He brings out this handy dandy jammer that he just has with him all of the time, I guess, to jam the cameras in the house. And he whips out his gloves and he just looks through everything. And it seems completely futile until Alex realizes when he's looking through the library that the outlets are really weird. Those outlets are closer than six feet apart, which Alex, being of course supremely intelligent, knows is against the US national electrical regulations. And so voila, he knows one of them is fake. And he's just exactly right. He goes to this fake outlet, he gets some stuff out of it, he reads it. We don't know exactly what it is yet because tension or whatever, even though everything is normally explained to us within five pages and this will be no different. And his uncle like comes home as Alex is doing this, but Alex is able to play it off like he's just grabbing the Count of Monte Cristo because he's just such a literate man. And he heads home with this new intel. Then there's this awkward dinner with Ava where Alex is just really distant and they're fighting because he's not telling her anything. She justifiably has some hangups with that kind of behavior given the fact that her entire life story was actually a lie. I don't know what you want me to tell you. The truth. I lowered my voice when the diners at the next table shot me an alarmed look. That's all I want, please. My fa- Michael lied to me my entire life and I don't want you to start. A shadow passed over Alex's face before it disappeared. I won't lie unless the truth hurts you. So yeah, just really cute behavior yet again, where Alex has absolutely no respect for her agency or desires. Anyways, obviously, because this plot is just continuing to develop at an exponential rate, we learned during Alex's next POV chapter that when the whole event went down, it was Uncle Ivan who helped Alex dig into his parents' death. Ivan agreed with him off the jump that it wasn't just a simple home invasion, which was what the police were trying to rule it as. And apparently those burglars were also arrested, but a hit was ordered for them to take them out in prison, which, you know, that's suspicious. And Ivan, I guess, was just the person who dug into all of that and found out that who ordered the hit on Alex's entire family? Michael Chen. Yup, it was Michael. And Alex has just done, apparently, a bunch of reprehensible to, to try to destroy his life in the time since then. Except what Alex has now learned after searching that random outlet in the library is that it was not Michael Chen, after all, who was responsible for the death of his family. It was Uncle Ivan the whole time. So yeah, that's tough. Instantly after learning this, Alex has mobilized like the entire board of his company to usurp Ivan's position as CEO. And he officially dethrones him, which he knows is going to piss off Uncle Ivan. So Alex is just vibing in his house, like waiting for Uncle Ivan to show up and yell at him when Ava comes over wanting to talk about the relationship again because Alex is just being such a piece of shit to her. But anyways, as Alex predicted, Ivan shows up at this point. And because Ava's there, they end up having this like really tense, weird conversation. And Ivan's just waxing poetic about how excited he is to retire when clearly he just wants to pound Alex's face into the pavement. Alex makes him tea, they do this over tea, and then Ivan ends up dropping the fact that he's just a really paranoid old man, you know? Life is really hard, it can be dangerous, and so he has cameras everywhere, including the library, which internally Alex is like, F I only used my handy dandy top of the line jammer to block the bedroom and kitchen cameras. Of course, how could I be so foolish? Which is just so ridiculous, but whatever. Ivan ends up leaving. I mean, it's tense. Like clearly Ivan knows that Alex knows what's going on there. And then random time skip, one page later, two weeks have passed and Ivan has threatened Alex into visiting him, which of course he does. Hello, uncle. So you finally made it, you little sh Uncle Ivan at this point is not looking good, okay? He has like welts all over, he's going bald, he's super thin. It's just clearly not been a good time for him. But anyways, Ivan gets straight to business as this book does. And he tells Alex that Alex has to immediately give him back the CEO position, leave the company, and also wire Ivan an additional $50 million in emotional damages. And he has to do this immediately because if he doesn't, then Ivan will kill the hostages. Who are the hostages, you're wondering? Because of course it turns out that he does in fact have hostages. Who's been kidnapped? That's right, it's Ava. But it's also, 
Bridget, the princess of a fictional European country. And these two are just vibing, very scared, obviously. They're tied up and they're being held onto by this just gigantic man who's wearing a pair of camo pants that Alex names in his head Camo. And Alex immediately feels a deep rage at this injustice. He decides everyone here will die. He is vengeance. But first, he has to give, I should you not, his own villain monologue. Oh yeah, we get more. And in this monologue, Alex is kind of trying to play Ivan into believing that he doesn't care about Ava at all, for reasons that become quickly unclear considering the leverage that Alex brings into this room and also the fact that he's apparently pretty sure that Ivan will end up killing everybody in the room anyways when the conversation is over. And also, Ivan already knows as his partner everything that Alex is saying here, so nobody knows for sure why Alex feels compelled to do this. But for us, for the audience, he lays out exactly how he went about his revenge against Michael Chen. You think it was a coincidence that Josh and I were assigned to the same room our freshman year? A hefty bribe with the right person goes far, and there's no better way to destroy your enemy than from the inside. I played the dead parents card to gain his sympathy until he invited me over for the holidays. And while everyone was asleep, I snooped. I bugged your house, went through your father's files, found lots of interesting information. Why do you think his business took so many hits over the years? A tear rolled down Ava's cheek, but I kept going. I'm sorry, sunshine. I dismantled his empire, piece by piece, and you and Josh had no clue. I uttered a soft laugh, even as my chest burned. This year was going to be the grand finale, the year in which my plan to take down his company publicly and humiliatingly came together. But I needed one more piece of information, one more excuse to search through his office. Then Josh, my ticket into your house every Thanksgiving, announced he was volunteering in Central America. Most inconvenience. I needed another in. That's where you entered the picture. Josh did most of the heavy lifting himself when he asked me to look after you, but I planted the idea of moving into his house. I smiled, my heart slowly shredding itself apart. After all, it was much easier to make you fall in love with me when you had to see me every day. And you did. It was so easy, it was almost embarrassing. Sweet, trusting Ava, so eager to fix broken things. So desperate for love, she'd take it anywhere she could find it. Clearly he's just laying it on thick with this. Once again, like, nobody knows why. Because he immediately pivots and he's like, I got my revenge. And I f***ed him up double bad because it turns out that he wanted to murder his daughter, who wasn't even really his daughter. Booyah, or it would be a booyah if it really was Michael Chen who killed my family, but it was you, Uncle Ivan. And immediately Ivan responds with his own villain monologue. If you're keeping track at home, this is the third villain monologue in about 50 pages. And it turns out that Ivan framed Michael because Michael was the primary business rival of Alex's dad. And he was just kind of an easy sitting duck type dude who would be believable enough to Alex to be the target of his revenge. And we also learned that Ivan killed Alex's family because Ivan was into Alex's mom, but she rejected him. And this man thought to himself, what if today, a Wednesday, I just went full unadulterated incel. What if we did that? You know, like I wonder what would happen. And what Alex found in that outlet that kind of confirmed to him that it was Ivan all along was the original letters that were between Ivan and Alex's mom. So Ivan also apparently thinks that he has Alex kind of in a checkmate position here because apparently Madeline, yep, that's right. That girl from the pool told him that Alex loved Ava, which is honestly even more funny because again, at the time, Ava was like lying out of her ass. But Ivan is pretty sure as a result that he's got the leverage here with the hostages, regardless of all of the vitriol that Alex is putting out there. And he's just like, how about you wire me the money and give me back the position and, and we can call it even. And Alex has this moment where in his internal monologue, he thinks, I wondered if he knew Bridget was the princess of Eldora. If he did, he was an idiot for dragging her into this. If he didn't, he was an idiot for not doing his research. Which is just really funny, like as a concept, because again, why is she here? What is this woman doing in this book? But anyways, it turns out that double checkmate, Alex just goes, sure, I can totally do those things for you, Uncle Ivan. I can wire back that money. I can give you your position or I could save your life. Because remember like 10 pages ago when Ivan visited Alex to yell at him for taking away his job and had tea at Alex's house? You can buy anything on the black market these days, I said, playing idly with the ugly monkey paperweight on the desk, including deadly poisons. The one currently destroying your system, quite similar to thallium. It's odorless, tasteless, colorless, hard to identify because it's so rare. And its symptoms often point to a range of other illnesses. But unlike thallium, it has no widely known antidote. Luckily for you, uncle, there is a secret antidote and I have a vial stashed away. Yeah, Alex apparently dosed him in secret with this slow acting, super ultra giga rare poison, which again, with this kind of leverage, it just really makes a girl wonder, you know, like why he had to do Ava so dirty during his villain monologue, but whatever, you know, because when they're talking here, just, as if on cue, three things happened at once. Ava threw herself at a distracted camo and knocked the gun out of his hand. Bridget's bodyguard tackled camo from behind and caught him in a chokehold, and I whipped out the gun hidden in the shoulder holster beneath my coat and pointed it at my uncle. I used my other hand to send a quick one number message on my phone without taking my eyes off Ivan. There was no cue, by the way, like they're all just that good, I guess. And Bridget's <laughs> bodyguard, she's got a new one, by the way, her old one, bodyguard number one retired at this point, just hops out of nowhere and they went instantly in, in that one paragraph. And Uncle Ivan, now recognizing the fact that he's completely lost, is like, Alex, we're family. <laughs> and Alex looks at him with darkness in his eyes and he's just like, we're not family. You 
you killed my family. And he makes Ava and Bridget leave to go and call the police outside. And Ivan's still groveling. He's like, think of the good times, Alex. But then he just gets like immediately shot as soon as the girls are out of the room. And Alex says, unfortunately for you, I'm not someone who waxes poetic before I pull the trigger. You'll die today, looking as ugly on the outside as you are on the inside. Which is unbelievably rich, considering that, again, Alex had his own villain monologue just like mere moments before this. But anyways, he shoots his uncle like seven more times. You know, it's kind of like, stop, he's already dead energy here. And Bridget's bodyguard, who's still there, like holding down the guy in camo is like, you good, bestie? Like, you doing all right? You know, just watching all of this happen. And Alex is like, yeah, I'm doing so great. You know, you should head out. You can leave the guy in camo to me. And the bodyguard, even though he's kind of suspicious about what's about to happen, rightfully takes his leave. And then for lack of a better and cuter and more romantic way to phrase this, um, Alex essentially skins this guy alive. Yeah, it's fade to black, but it's fully like implied torture to death, which is a lot. Once again, what about hello? How are you? Anyways, after he's done, he just walks out of this building. In my head, there's a vine boom that accompanies his exit. And that's that. That all really did happen in this book. Less than 60 pages ago, we were eating turkey with Michael in the living room. Alex and Ava were smashing in a student health center, and now we have come to this. I just hope you understand why this video needed to be made, okay? Like, I never had the choice. But we're not done. There's more. You know, how could we possibly stop here? How could this be enough nonsense for one book? It's not. After Alex is all finished skinning Camo Guy alive, he meets Ava and Bridget outside. And the both of them are obviously traumatized after what happens, as one would be. And Ava especially just doesn't really know what to believe anymore, given everything that Alex was saying in the room with his uncle about her not mattering to him and just being like a means to an end. Everything in the villain monologue is really throwing her off. So she goes up to Alex after he comes out and they chat and she's like, were you being for serious? You know, like was anything that we actually had real to you? And Alex just has a lot of enemies because of his big powerful business. And he's really worried that one of them is going to end up kidnapping Ava eventually because that's just a thing that happens all of the time. You know, rich wives of billionaires just get ransomed constantly. So in order to protect her from that fate, he decides to simply lie, you and me. I was afraid to ask, but I had to know. Was any of it real? Alex stilled and I held my breath, hoping, praying. I tried to warn you, sweetheart. He said, his face impassive. I told you not to romanticize me, to harden that soft heart. He just loves saying that. It was my one courtesy for the kindness that you've shown me over the years. But you fell for me anyway. Consider it a lesson for the future. Pretty words and pretty faces don't equal pretty souls. So yeah, very cool. Ava's like dead inside now. And we also learned soon after this that, get this, all of the paramedics and the police that were called by Ava and Bridget to help deal with this situation. Yeah, they were all hired in advance by Alex. I had cleanup teams on standby in various cities, ready to swoop in in case any of my many plans went to Rye. No one knew about them, not even my uncle when he'd been alive. They were discreet, efficient, and looked like normal people who held normal jobs, not fixers who could bury any body, erase any evidence, and jam any communications, including outgoing calls to local police stations. Every police officer and paramedic who'd showed up today was on my team, and they'd played their roles convincingly. Yeah, so Alex chats a bit with one of his boys, and then he just decides to burn down Ivan's house to cover up the crime, and he uses his mysterious, all-powerful connections yet again, so that fire is never investigated. Once again, Alex's network does a lot of heavy lifting in this book, you know, like he just knows everyone, I guess, and can do anything. Yeah, that's how this section of the book wraps, but we're not done. <laughs> So it's been a couple of months, we have another time skip, and this entire time, Ava's life has just sucked. It's just been a pretty bad time for her, coming to terms with the fact that both her dad and her ex-boyfriend gaslit her for multiple years. Many people are saying it's not an easy thing to get over. She has stopped talking to Alex entirely ever since what happened and just gone into a full depression arc. It's just kind of grim out there for our girl, now that she's trying to find a reason to live after learning that there's no good in the world. But despite how difficult that is, she actually starts to do what I would argue is decently well for herself after a couple of months of psychological torment. She has this really nice scene where she realizes that the pain of everything that she'd gone through was holding her down and stopping her from being able to live her life. So in order to get through that, she'd have to just force her way forward. Like nobody was going to do it for her, you know? And to represent this realization, she ends up going to a pool and jumping in and just swimming around on her own. It's this really big moment for her, obviously, with both her phobia and also what it represents. I'd survived not one, not two, but three near-death experiences. I'd had my heart broken and smashed, but I was still breathing. I'd lived with my nightmares almost my whole life and still found the courage to dream. I swam until my limbs ached. After that, I stayed in the pool for a while longer, reveling in my accomplishments. Me, swimming alone for, I snuck a peek at the clock, an hour without a panic attack, more than an hour. I tilted my head up, my first real smile in months spreading across my face. It was small, but it was there. Baby steps. Above me, the storm had abated, the angry gray clouds giving way to blue skies. And through the domed glass, I saw, quite clearly, the pale glimmers of a rainbow. So yeah, she's kind of having her like hot girl healing summer. And on top of that, earlier in the book, Ava had gotten this very prestigious photography fellowship that was going to take place in New York after she graduated 
COVID. I didn't mention it earlier because it wasn't relevant at the time, but now it matters because it's a big deal. And she was planning to move to New York with Alex, but obviously after what happens, she's finding it really, really hard to be excited about that future since he's not going to be there anymore. You know, it's like tough for her to imagine. So in order to get herself like pumped up about it again, she ends up switching the location of the fellowship to London, which is a massive deal because earlier in the book, she said that she never saw herself capable of traveling over an ocean because of her fear of water. The thought of it just filled her with this like paralyzing anxiety, but she steals herself and prepares to do it because she's decided that she just needs to have a fresh start somewhere new. And that's exactly what she does. So yeah, like obviously she's hurting, but she's also kind of on the up and up, you know, she's trying to figure shit out. It's kind of inspirational or it would be if that was the direction that the ending of this book took, but obviously that would be impossible. You know, like why would this book champion such a reasonable and well-adjusted recovery? You know, that that's not gonna happen. That would be silly because meanwhile, Alex has just like thrown himself into his work. He's clearly suffering. He's drinking whiskey in the middle of the work day. He's like angry all the time at everyone. I really didn't think it was possible, but he's like somehow more tortured than he was before. And he does hate himself for what he did to Ava, but of course he still does it anyways, because once again, he has like absolutely no respect for anybody's agency other than his own. More on that soon. But anyways, while Ava's on her self-improvement grind, who shows up at Alex's office, but Bridget again, for some reason. Sir, Carolina, his assistant, poked her head in again, her face pale and not a little terrified. Uh, you have another guest. If they don't have an appointment, I don't want to see them. About that, it's, don't bother, I'll announce myself. A statuesque blonde swept in like she owned the place. The vein in my temple pulsed harder. Princess Bridget of Eldora, here to see <laughs> I mean, Alex Volkov. So yeah, Bridget's there because apparently her new bodyguard has discovered that as you might expect, Alex is having Ava followed again for her own protection. Just a very cool thing to do again without telling someone. Also, this is not like relevant to the plot at all, but I just want to mention it because I think it's ridiculous. Apparently Bridget's new bodyguard is a former Navy SEAL, which considering the fact that she's a princess of a non United States country, just strikes me as a little weird, you know, as a decision for the crown to make. But apparently the person who was following Ava was also a Navy SEAL, so they were like besties and he just like told the new bodyguard everything. But anyways, Bridget like pretends for a few seconds to be mad at Alex about this, but she's not really there to be like righteously angry at Alex for ignoring Ava's boundaries so much as she's there to convince Alex to admit that he really does love Ava and to go and grovel to her, which is wild. Again, like Ava does not know about this. And Bridget does this because apparently nobody can get through to Ava. She's clearly struggling, yada, yada, yada. And all of her friends are just like worried about her and they don't know what else to do. Which again, just seems to be factually not true. Like Ava's suffering, of course, as you would be after any breakup, much less a breakup with this kind of drama behind it. But she's clearly making moves for herself that like Bridget's just choosing to ignore. In terms of Bridget being like the worst friend to ever do it, honestly, it's almost worse that she's right and Alex does in fact still love Ava because where does she expect this to go? You know, like you really want your bestie to get back together with this man? No, obviously that's, that's insane. Like I said, I despise what you did to her, but I also believe you love her, even if you're too stubborn or stupid to see it. I have an IQ of 160, I said, insulted. <laughs> Intellectual intelligence doesn't equal emotional intelligence, she retorted. And do not interrupt a princess. It's terrible etiquette. As I was saying, you're too stubborn or stupid to see it. And now it's too late. So Alex finds out through Bridget that Ava is flying out today to London in just one hour, apparently, from when this conversation is happening. Which like, honestly, why even go and see him at this point? What are you trying to accomplish, Bridget? And he is suddenly and finally convinced, I guess, that he made a massive mistake because he just buys a random ticket and busts into the gate, hoping to find Ava before she leaves to do God knows what, you know, things like moving on and trying to make a future that's brighter than her past, you know, just terrible stuff. He can't have that. And it's supposed to be this classic rom-com airplane scene Scene, but it's subverted because Ava is already gone. This bitch is over the ocean, okay? She's out of there. And obviously Alex finds this very difficult to accept, let's just say. And immediately after Alex goes to the airport only to find that Ava's already gone, we have this cool time skip of at least a couple of weeks. I mean, we don't really know how long, but we find out that Ava is just absolutely thriving in London. I loved London. I loved its energy, the posh accents, and the anticipation that I might cite one of the royals any day. I didn't, but I could, though I reassured Bridget that she'd always be my favorite royal. Most of all, I loved that it was a fresh start. No one knew me here. I could be whoever I wanted. And the creative spark I'd lost in those dark weeks after Philadelphia came rushing back. So yeah, she's clearly doing better. You know, like she's recovering. It's great. I know you're wondering where we could possibly go from here. And you guessed it, Alex shows up because of course he does one day when she's walking home from classes for her fellowship. And the two of them have what I honestly believe is an all time cringe conversation. Ava immediately starts panicking as soon as she sees him, just backsliding completely. She's clearly really upset, but Alex came prepared to fight, okay? From the jump, like as soon as he sees her, he's like, I love you, I miss you, I'm sorry, like please find in your heart to forgive me. I mean, honestly, he answers this conversation with like a decent enough line. You got your revenge and I'm not interested in whatever new game you're playing. So leave me alone. 
pain slashed across his face. This isn't a game, I promise. This is just me asking you for, not forgiveness, not right now, but hope that one day you won't hate me and we might get a second chance. He swallowed hard. I'll always need you, sunshine. And I am just a murdering, psychopathic, super genius, standing in front of a girl, asking if she will love him. Ah, uh, well, uh, but what, uh, yeah, I mean, that quote seems more reasonable when I was writing the script initially. Like it's desperate, but it's not like outright problematic, you know? But honestly, I think that the only reason why I was like, that's not too bad is because of where this conversation ends up going. Because obviously Ava shoots him down because she's still really mad. And Alex in trying to like explain himself reveals that he's just had her followed for the past six months, which begets this very cool conversation moment. Wait. I held up one hand. You had me followed? For your protection. I couldn't believe it. How is that okay? That's, that's crazy. How long? Oh my God. My eyes widened. You have someone following me in London too? He stared at me, his face stony. Unreal, I breathed. You are truly psycho. Where is he? I looked around frantically. I didn't see anyone suspect, but the most dangerous people were those who looked anything but. Call him off, right now. I already did. I narrowed my eyes. That was too easy. You did? Yes, because I'm taking over his duties. Oh my God, what? Like, excuse me, if this man was not described as hot, nobody would find this to be a romantic thing to do. This is deranged behavior. You'll be seeing a lot more of me from now on. The hell I will. The thought of seeing him every day sends me into a tailspin of panic. I'll file a restraining order against you. Have you arrested for stalking? You can try, but I can't guarantee my friends and the British government will comply. His face darkened. And if you think I'm leaving you alone and unprotected anywhere, you don't know me at all. So there's literally nothing that she can do here. There, there's no recourse against this man. Ava just has to live like this now. And to her credit, Ava does not respond well to this new reality. And she like yells at him about the damage that he did and is continuing to do to her through like this. And she literally begs him to leave her alone. But because Alex is just a consent king, this is what he says. Just leave me alone. Alex's chest heaved like he couldn't get enough air into his lungs. I can't do that, sweetheart. I'll wait however long it takes, but I'll never be okay with a world in which you're alone. Who says I will be? Maybe I'll find someone else. His eyes darkened to a furious shade of emerald and his shoulders tensed even more. Somewhere thunder boomed. I hadn't noticed the weather morph from sunny to its current gray, gloomy states, but I wouldn't be surprised if Alex had the power to control it with his emotions. The hell you will, he snarled. I'll kill any man that touches you. <laughs> you have no right, I hissed back. I don't belong to you. The muscles in his jaw popped. That's where you're wrong. I f***ed up massively, but I will earn your forgiveness one day. And you are mine, always. No matter how much time or distance separates us. Which is just a crazy thing to say. Okay, like let's just pause for a second. Imagine having the absolute audacity to tell your ex who you dumped by the way, that she can either option A, take you back or option B, never date anybody ever again because if she dates somebody, then you will kill them. And we all know by this point in the book that Alex is not messing around with this because lest you forget, he literally skins that guy alive in his house. And if Ava's so uncomfortable with this that she wants to like report him to the police for stalking her, he's like, actually, yeah, the British crown, they're my besties. You're f sunshine, deal with it. And you're telling me that I, as the reader, am supposed to like this man? I'm supposed to find him attractive? What? Anyways, so this conversation just really goes nowhere because to Alex, no does not in fact mean no. And he just ends up following Ava home that night and will follow Ava home every night now forever. That's where this book is going. We also learned that he abdicated his position as CEO of his company so that way he could spend literally all of his time just following Ava around and winning her back, which again, I think we're meant to feel is like a really dashing romantic thing to do because he's an ambitious boy. You know, he's a capitalist. He loves his job, but he loves her more. But in reality, when you think about it for longer than one second, it is just completely deranged. But yeah, he makes good on his promise and just starts following her around literally everywhere that she goes. And he ends up buying her these really expensive gifts until she tells him to stop, which I don't know why you tell him to stop getting you gifts because it seems like it's like the one benefit that you're getting out of this situation that you can't leave, but you do you queen. And somehow this entire saga of events is very surprising to Ava. I never thought Alex Volkov would become my stalker, but there we were, there we were. I don't know what life you're living or what book you think you're in, but if this is unexpected behavior from this man at this point, we are simply consuming different content. Oh, whatever, you know, like that's what he's doing. And then very suddenly we get a one year time skip. <laughs> one entire year passes. And it turns out that his behavior is just the same that entire time through her entire fellowship. Just, you know, following her around and walking her to and from class and refusing to leave her alone. Poor Ava at this point has been like Stockholmed into kind of appreciating it. Alex and I developed a new well, I wasn't sure if I could call it a friendship, but it was a step up from whatever we had when he arrived in London a year ago, a year ago. He still waited for me in front of my flat every morning and walked me home after my workshops every afternoon. Sometimes we talked, sometimes we didn't. He helped me practice my self-defense moves, assembled my new dining table after my old one broke and served as a de facto assistant in some of my photo shoots. It had taken a long time before we reached that point, but 
We'd gotten there. He was trying, more than trying. And while I'd regained a modicum of trust in him, something held me back from fully forgiving him. I could see how much it hurt him every time I pushed him away, but the wounds from his and Michael's betrayals, while they were healing, ran deep. And I was still learning to trust myself, much less other people. Which is just interesting, you know, considering that what's holding her back isn't even the fact that he's been stalking her against her wishes for a year. For me, I think that would make the top of the list, but anyways, right now she's at an art show to celebrate the end of her fellowship. And at this art show, all of the photographers are hoping to sell the photographs that they've taken during the year to buyers that appreciate their art, you know, jumpstarting their career. I would be happy if I sold one. Knowing that someone, anyone, liked my work enough to pay for it sent a swarm of happy jitters through my stomach. So yeah, it was kind of expecting to sell nothing when suddenly, at the very beginning of the art show, an anonymous buyer sweeps in and buys up Ava's entire collection. Now, who could that possibly be? Like, do I even have to tell you? And again, I think we're supposed to see this as like a very sweet thing for Alex to do, but what it actually does is just prevent anybody else from being able to appreciate Ava's artwork. She'll never know if her photos are good enough for somebody to want them on their own merit and not because they're her psychotic ex who is very possessive of everything that she creates and is also hoping that she'll take him back. And if that's not enough for you yet to get the ick here with this man and just everything that he's done in this entire book, if you're still somehow cooking, if you still kind of like him, everyone's at some kind of opening or closing ceremony for this art show and the director comes out and is like, surprise, we have a surprise. It's a surprise performance just for you guys. Isn't that wonderful? And Alex walks out onto the stage dressed to the nines, about to be on his and for reasons completely unclear to me, this man just starts singing. Need I remind you, can't sing from 200 pages ago? Yeah, he can and he is. Riddle me that. I realize this is quite a surprise as a live performance wasn't in the program tonight, Alex said. And if you know me, you know I'm not famous for my patronage of the arts or my singing skills. Whether it's music, photography, film, or painting, the arts reflect the world around us. And for too long, I only saw the dark side, the seedy underbellies, the ugly truths. Photographs reminded me of moments in time that never lasted. Songs reminded me that words have the power to rip one's heart out. Why then would I care about art when it was so terrible and destructive? It was a bold statement to make in front of London's art world, but no one heckled. No one so much as breathed. Alex had us all under the spell of his words. Then someone came into my life and appended everything I thought I knew. She was everything I wasn't. Pure hearted, trusting, optimistic. She showed me the beauty that existed in this world. And through her, I learned the power of faith, joy, love. But I'm afraid I've tainted her with my untruths. And I'm hoping with all my heart that one day she'll find her way out of the darkness and into the light again. And then he sings. And apparently his voice is blessed by the angels. He's the best to ever do it in the eyes of this audience. Me personally, I wanted to throw up in my mouth. This is finally enough, I guess, for Ava. And after his performance, she wants to talk to him, but she can't find him. He has disappeared. This is crazy. He never does this. And while she's wandering around looking for him, one of her friends from the program ends up pulling her aside and asking her out on a date. And Ava's not the worst person in the world, so she tries to let him down gently. You're one of my closest friends here and I'm so glad I met you. You're a great guy. Ouch. Jack winced. I feel like that's not a good thing when used in this context. I laughed. No, trust me, it's a good thing. You're cute and funny and talented too and any girl would be lucky to date you. I sense a butt coming, he said wryly. But... <sighs> but she's busy, a smooth voice interrupted. From tonight through the foreseeable future. Yep. Yeah. It's Alex. And because answering for somebody who isn't your girlfriend was not enough for this man, he also decides to hit Jack with a very cool threat. You're the guy who performed tonight and is always waiting for Ava outside WYP. Jack narrowed his eyes. Who are you again? Someone who will rip your entrails out and strangle you with them if you don't take your hands off her. Again, just so well adjusted. So wonderful, just the perfect man. But it works, I guess. Like it rizzes her up at this point because one page later they're hugging and she's saying how much she missed him and he's saying that he'll never leave her again. And just like that, they're macking in the art gallery. Actually, they end up having sex because Alex used his magical connections again to make everybody leave the art gallery. So it was just them two inside of it. And yeah, just like that, they've made up completely. He was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. He crushed his lips to mine, hard and demanding. I yielded with no resistance, letting him into every part of me, my heart, my soul, my life. And you know what? Alex and I, we fit perfectly. No, you don't. It's literally Stockholm Syndrome. This is what Stockholm Syndrome does. Also, before any man get any ideas, if you pull this nonsense and start trying to serenade the women in your life, you're just gonna end up getting bullied, okay? I, 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 I'm just giving you the advice that you need to succeed in this life. But yeah, that's where we end. Within 20 pages of Ava's move to London on her upswing in her thriving recovery era, she has undergone a year of non-consensual stalking, gotten over that, and gotten back together with Alex. And, and now they're gonna be with each other forever.
whatever, I, I, I guess. We get an epilogue where they're doing Thanksgiving with Alex's old Croft Maga coach and they smash. And then we get a bonus chapter where they're at an apple orchard and they smash. And we're left to assume that this is how it ends for them. They never face danger again. We also get a cool setup where Bridget's brother, who is the crown prince of her small fictional European nation, has abdicated the throne and run off with a woman to marry her. And Bridget's now next in line for the crown, except she's also very clearly in love with bodyguard number two, which that creates some drama, as I'm sure you can imagine. So yeah, the geopolitical stakes of this Wattpad series just are continuing to rise, but we're not gonna cover that right now, okay? That's not in this book. I just hope you understand why I felt the need to share this with you. Truly, this is the worst book I've ever read that I've still felt compelled to help others in my life experience. So yeah, I hope you had a good time. I hope you enjoyed this odyssey that we embarked upon together. And I hope that you find a partner in your life that treats you better than Alex treated Ava in this book. Depending on what you guys think, I might recap more books in this series. I haven't actually read any of them yet, only this one. Or I'll just do more videos like this in general. If you have any ideas or like requests that you wanna see, please feel free to leave them below in the comments. And yeah, if you had a good time today, please like and subscribe, etc. Eh. Okay, that's all I have to say. Bye.